you're going to hear one of the best raconteurs in the, of the sport. He is a, an author. Um, he was a sports writer for Newsday for many years. And uh, there's a bio uh, on Bill Knack in your program. Bill is going to give you a really in-depth presentation on Secretariat Thoroughbred Racing. So let's welcome Bill Knack. Um, thank you for coming. I had a nostalgic experience coming into this place uh, last night. Uh, landed at Islip, uh, Long Island Islip Airport, and I had not been there for many, many years. I used to cover the town of Islip for Newsday, back when Harry Kangeiser was the supervisor. And uh, Newsday was writing about land scandals and rezoning scandals and things. And uh, I hung around a lot at the Newsday office in Ronkonkoma, um, which no longer exists, I don't think, and it's certainly not an office at Newsday. But uh, that's where this story all begins. That's why I felt a little nostalgic coming in last night. About five miles from the airport is that old Newsday office. And I had done a series uh, on sewers and freshwater recharge uh, back in 1971, three-part series for Newsday that started on the front page and uh, of the paper. And, and uh, it took me six months to do it, and it was an exhausting thing. I learned all about the big freshwater bubble that exists under Long Island and what the implications are if you pump fresh water and sewage water out to the Great South Bay instead of recharging it and stuff, and that's what it involved. And by the end of that, I was really kind of tired about tired of sewers and fresh water on Long Island. And uh, at the Christmas party in 1971, uh, at, at the Ronkonkoma office, we were visited by the editor of the entire newspaper out of Garden City, David Laventhal one of the best journalists I ever knew, and at the time I didn't know this, but he was a closet horse player. And uh, the evening was wearing on, and we were pretty well into the eggnog, and uh, one of the rep my fellow reporters said, Bill, why don't you recite all the Derby winners from 1875 to the present, which I memorized as a kid. I was a historian of horse racing as a young kid, worked at the racetrack as a groom and a hot walker, had a lot of hands-on experience with horses, and uh, Swaps was my hero. Uh, he won the 55 Derby, and I got to Newsday, and I, 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 the guys found out about my love for racing, and so I stood up in the middle of the city room in the desk, and I recited all the Kentucky Derby winners. <laughs> I'll just give you a brief taste. Aristides, Vagrant, Baden, Baden, Day, Star, Lord, Murphy, Fonzo, Hindu, Apollo, Leonidas, Buchanan, Joe Cotton, Ben Ally, Montrose, Macbeth, Spokane, Riley, King, Manasseh, Lookout, Chant, Helma, Ben Brush, Typhoon, the Second, Plaudit, Manuel, and Lieutenant Gibson. That's the 19th century. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll not belabor you with the 20th, but. Um, uh, when that recitation was over, David Laventhal sidled up next to me and he said, why do you know that? And I said, well, gee, David, I said, uh, I know a lot more about things than just sewers and freshwater recharge on Long Island. It's un-American not to know all the derby winners. And he said, seriously, and I told him my background, and he said, you're not happy doing what you're doing here, are you? And I said, no. I said, there are days in the Suffolk County Legislature in Riverhead where I'd rather be uh, having a root canal. <laughs> And he said, uh, without blinking, he said, would you like to be our horse racing writer? And I said, what? I couldn't believe my ears. I asked him to say it again. He said, we need a horse racing writer, and Newsday is going to a seven-day-a-week paper in April, and you'd be perfect for it. And uh, I said, gee, David, I said, give me a chance to think about this. He said, well, get back to me as soon as you can. Well, five minutes later, I walked up to him and I said, David, that offer you made, as a sit still stand? <laughs> he said, yeah. I said, well, I'm your man. So in March of 72, three months later, after cleaning up my desk at my city side, I walked into Belmont Park with a spiral notepad. And I was in heaven. And two months later, I was doubly so because um, an unknown, unraced two-year-old had come up from Florida on a van. Two months after I got to Belmont Park, he got to Belmont Park, and his name was Secretariat. So our lives joined. Uh, at, we were joined at the hip from almost the beginning, and um, it was the most extraordinary experience uh, in my life as a, as a sports writer for certain. Nothing could possibly top it um, because there were so many things that happened that were so lucky. 
at that very time, in the same barn at Belmont Park where there's 1,500 horses and 70 barns, in the same barn as this young unraced two-year-old was a horse named Reva Ridge. He had won the Kentucky Derby, and now he's coming up to the Belmont. He lost the Preakness, coming up to the Belmont, and I was all over him. And while I was at the barn one morning, Jimmy Gaffney, the exercise rider, came up to me and he said, I want to show you something. So I said, what's that? He said, come with me. So we walked up the shed. We walked past Reaver Ridge. And he waved into the stall number seven. And he said, what do you think? And I looked in. He looked like a Greek discus thrower. Gorgeous chestnut. He had muscles on his eyebrows. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, my God, he looks like a show horse. He said, I said, can he run? And he said, I'll never forget this. He said, someday this horse will make everybody forget Reaver Ridge. Well, you know, come on. <laughs> he had just won the Kentucky Derby. He was going to win the Belmont by five. And now somebody's telling me there's a better one in the barn who's never even raced. And I said, well, what's his pedigree? He said, by bold ruler or something royal. And I went, my goodness gracious, that's fabulous pedigree. And so uh, I ended up... Uh, Two weeks later, I was at Belmont, and uh, I look in the. Pr I said, "What's his name?" He said, "Secretary." And I, two weeks later, I was in the press. I was in the press box at. Uh, I guess it was Aqueduct, and I looked in the program, and there he was. Well, he lost that day by, but he came out of the gate. He was on the inside, and he came out of the gate. There was a horse named Quebec, two horses outside of him, and Quebec came out of the gate and did a left turn right into him. He almost went down to his knees. He was a big oafish kind of a kid at that time. And he came, sort of came back to his feet, was weaving in and out of horses. He couldn't get by. He was a Cadillac in the middle of a bunch of Volkswagens. <laughs> and he finally gets clear, and he's sailing at the end. And, uh, and he, he loses by barely, but he's d gaining like crazy. Well, the next time he runs, he wins by five. And then we go up to Saratoga. And he wins three races at Saratoga, and he got the attention of everybody in the hopeful stakes when he started out last. And as they went around the far turn, suddenly his silks disappeared behind one horse, reappeared, disappeared, reappeared, disappeared. And in a period of about 190 yards, he went from last to first, turning for home. And people were just astonished. Art Kennedy, who was a big veteran race watcher, sat next to me and he said, my gosh, he said, he said, this horse runs, runs like a four-year-old. People were running around saying to Penny to Tweedy, um, and when you syndicate this horse, I want a piece of him. This is already, this horse was just a baby. Next thing I know, he's running, he's blowing by everybody. He had such a dominant two-year-old year that he became the horse of the year, which is rare. It had never happened before. Unanimous horse of the year as a two-year-old never happens. Never happened in the sport. And um, in January, he was his uh, Chris Chenery, who bred him, Penny's father, passed away, and they had to pay uh, estate taxes, which were very high in those days. And so they had to sell their biggest asset. So they sold Secretariat for six point oh eight million dollars. He became the most expensive horse in history. In fact, as I wrote in Newsday in a story that started on the back page, um, that he was uh, worth, gold was selling it. I, I looked it up in the office. I said gold was selling at $90 an ounce, believe it or not. Um, and uh, he was 1,154 pounds. I knew that because they had just weighed him. So I did the math and found out that he was literally worth three times his weight in gold. <laughs> And when you write that, people go, wow, this is. And so now he comes up to the, he starts his triple crown run. And he just, he wins the Bayshore, then he wins the Gotham. He loses the Wood Memorial because he had an abscess on his upper lip that nobody knew about, except for Lucian, the trainer, the groom, Eddie Sweat, the hot walker. And the veterinarian came around the barn the morning of the Wood Memorial to check for his lip tattoo. There's a tattoo in the upper lip that they check for every horse entered that day. It's to make sure that ringers don't get in, horses running for somebody else. So this tattoo cannot be removed. And so he was, um, uh, uh, he, he, uh, he looked at it, and when he lifted up the lip, he found this huge boil, about as big as a half dollar. And he said to Lucian, did you know this was here? And he, Lucian said, no, I didn't know. And he said, well, the horse is sound and he's fine, but I think you ought to know about this. 
because this horse is not right. I mean, and so instead of Lucian telling Turcotte, which is one of the big mysteries of my life, I have Lucian denied that he ever had an abscess. Anyway, that's another story, but um, everybody kind of knew in the barn, at least four or five people knew, and he didn't tell Turcotte. And so when you ask a horse to run, you don't throw the reins away. That's what you think. It's counterintuitive. When you ask a racehorse to run, you pull on the reins. You take it up, and he grabs the bit, and then he runs. Well, when you take, when he's got an abscess on his upper lip, and you pull back on the bit, it goes like this. It pulls the upper lip against the tooth, and he was throwing his head all the way around. Turkite couldn't understand it. Well, he finishes third. He ran like a goat. And everybody was just discombobulated. Here, that $6 million man had run like a $2 horse. And nobody could figure it out. I thought, well, I've spent all this time around this horse. Notebooks, every morning I had gotten up. It was all a waste of time, but that's OK. I had, it was a great learning experience. So we all go down to the Derby. Well, I found out later about the abscess, and that broke before the Derby. And the seed broke, and it was stopped being painful. Secretary came up to the Derby brilliantly. And he won, broke the track record, which, by the way, still stands today, 159 and 2. It was a fabulous performance. Then he goes on to the Preakness, and I'm sitting at the barn about two days before the race, sitting on, I was there with the horse every day, and I was sitting under his stall webbing, talking to Eddie Sweat. It was just me, the horse, and Eddie. It was like four in the afternoon on Thursday. And uh, all of a sudden, the horse sticks his nose out of the stall like a camel with his upper lip going like that. And I said to Eddie, I said, there's something wrong with this horse. What's wrong with him? And he looks up. Eddie comes over, and he plucks this little thing off of his whiskers. And he throws it up in the air and blows on it. And it comes down and settles in my hand. It was a pigeon feather that I'd caught on his whisker. It was driving him crazy. <laughs> and so uh, Eddie said, just a pigeon's feather. So I stuck it in my wallet along with my picture of swaps. And uh, unfortunately, that wallet was lifted at a prize fight in Madison Square Garden in 1985. And so I lost my pigeon feather and my picture of swaps. And uh, the crook did not have the decency to take what he wanted and put the rest of the wallet in the, in the, in the postal service box. So I, it's probably down 10 miles off the uh, barrier reef out there. And so anyway, it was a. Uh, uh, the Preakness, he blasted to the lead around the first turn. He sailed. He, it was the most astonishing move ever made in the Preakness. He finishes the, the real time. Eventually, uh, eventually, it was determined he ran in 153 flat, which was the fastest Preakness ever run. So he's now he's run the fastest Derby ever run, fastest Preakness ever run, which, by the way, is still the record at Pimlico. And now he comes up to the Belmont. He's on the cover of Time, Newsweek, and Sports Illustrated in one week. And uh, he has now become a rock star. And along with him, a rock star was Penny Tweedy, his manager and John's mother. She had taken over the stable. She was now his spokesman. The horse was a mute. So she spoke for him and eloquently. And the press loved her because she spoke in complete sentences. She spoke clearly. I mean, she had a master's in Colum at Columbia. I mean, she was really smart. And she was, she was very well educated and spoke very, very well. And she was a perfect spokesperson for the horse and attractive physically. She looked good on camera. She was everything you needed in an owner. No owner, no owner had ever been to me, in my experience, that uh, forthcoming and that visible. Not only that, she was a female owner. And they had never done anything in horse racing. They always were in the background. Talk to my trainer. That's what they'd say, not Penny. Don't talk to my trainer, talk to me. I'm his spokesperson. And so it was the dynamic duo. It was Penny and Secretariat, and then Turcotte and some of the others, and, and Lucian. And it was just a, a, that week was just amazing. With that horse on the cover of those three magazines, he, she was on the Today Show, all sorts of other TV appearances she was making. It was just and breathtaking because one of the things, it was a, on the Friday before the Preakness was the beginning of the televised Watergate hearings. And so everybody was saying, you know, you know, the country's gone to hell in a handbasket, and here's this horse uh, who was perfectly honest. 
He didn't beat his wife. Nobody had to call 9-11. <laughs> Um, he was like this perfect ideal, ideal athlete um, who just wanted hay, oats, and water and let me go. And people saw in this a kind of a symbol of perfection and as John Tweedy points out, it's also a symbol of nobility. And that's really what he was and, and she, you know, she was the, Penny was the queen and he was the prince. And she was taking him from one racetrack to another and entertaining everybody. America had a five-week recess from the Vietnam War, which is also still going on, as well as Watergate. And he comes up to the Belmont, and I call Lucian the night before the race, so what's he going to win by? And he said, I think he's going to win by more than he's ever won by in his life. I think he's going to win by 10. Well, he won by 31. <laughs> And he ran the mile and a half in 224 flat, which was a world record on the dirt. It is still the Belmont record. He now holds, still holds, after 40 some years, the track record in the Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont. And that, you know how many horses of his age have come and gone since then? About a million two. And nobody's approached him. And uh, it was a wonderful ride, I'll tell you that. And uh, every time I'd take somebody to Lexington to show him Secretariat when he was at stud, I'd pull that pigeon feather out of my wallet and I'd tell the story about it and I'd pass it around the car and uh, until somebody lifted it. But uh, in any event, um, I think you're going to enjoy this movie. It's about uh, John put it together. John, by the way, is a, as some of you might not know, is a, is a lawyer by trade, but he's got a real creative side and comes out in this movie the way he put it together about his mother. Uh, in many ways, it was a labor of love for him. And uh, he was, uh, uh, by the way, I have one little anecdote about John. There's an English teacher at the University of Colorado named Jane Brown, who was kind of a legendary t English professor, and she once said that John Tweedy was the best student she ever had at the University of Colorado. So he's not only a good lawyer, but he's also extremely literate and, uh, and puts together a great film. Enjoy it. I think you'll, uh, there was some stuff in here when I first saw it, I thought, oh, I, I didn't know this. And uh, anyway, enjoy.